now that we've got the sound up, good evening and welcome. My name is Gregory Squire, and I'm a violinist in the NZSO. However, for the purposes of this talk, and out of deference to the tragic element present in much of tonight's music, I shall be playing excerpts on an instrument much more suited to tragedy, my viola. which just spat the dummy and broke the string on me. I had intended to spend much of this talk on the music and life of Samuel Barber, particularly as when I was living in Scotland, I met and worked alongside his partner of more than 30 years, the composer, librettist, and opera director, Gian Carlo Menotti. But the story of Schumann and Brahms just seemed to take on a life of its own and will make up the bulk of tonight's presentation. However, I do remember conversations with Menotti, and particularly about the time he and Barber spent touring around Europe together, when they were still in their 20s. He remembered, he remembered the two of them blatting around the Alps in his Fiat Roadster, before they set up house in the Wolfgangsee, near Salzburg. It's a great car, isn't it? <laughs> So the Wolfgang says, where Barber, he wrote the original version of the Adagio you'll be hearing tonight. And those of you who are interested in musical trivia might like to know that um, the opening scenes of uh, The Sound of Music were filmed there. And Mozart's sister, Nan Earl, lived in one of the villages on the lake shore. Minotti also gave me valuable insights into which composers he and Barber admired. Knowing Minotti's reputation as an opera composer, I expected to hear Rossini and Verdi's names being mentioned. But to my surprise, he talked about Brahms and Schumann. He said it was the way they structured their melodies, particularly in the leader, the songs they wrote throughout their lives. He also said there was a backdrop of tragedy in most, if not all of them. Well, we can certainly hear a very melodic element to the melodies in Barber's symphony and in the Adagio. There's a lot of noise in the symphony, but listen out for a wonderful moment in the first movement where the brass pours for breath and we hear a beautiful languid melody scored for the classic tragic colors of cor anglais and violas. I have to say I had no idea what Minotti was referring to when he talked about the tragedy of Schumann's life. So he told me to go and read the book. I did, and I found not one, but three tragedies. Twenty seventh of February, eighteen fifty four. It's just past noon on a cold, rainy day in Dusseldorf. A man sits in his study, surrounded by scores. Music he has written that has yet to be performed. His wife, heavily pregnant, sits at the piano next door, playing a set of variations he has just completed. He picks up a score, <gasps> my Missa Sacra, sacred mass for choir and organ. He picks up another, my violin concerto for my good friend, Joseph Joachim. He won't play it. <sighs> my requiem. And finally, in the corner, covered in dust, a cello concerto. I wrote a requiem for myself, but my soul is in the cello concerto. with anguish, 
Wearing only a cloak and slippers, he dashes out into the cobbled streets, walking unsteadily, yet in haste, towards the river. Upon reaching the toll gate on the bridge, he halts, looks for a coin, and finding none, pushes past the toll collector. Before anyone can react, he is stumbled partway across. He looks back, then throws himself in the icy waters. Fishermen on a nearby boat pull the man from the water, only to see him try to jump in again. Forcibly, they bring him ashore, where a bystander recognizes him. Dr. Robert Schumann. He is 43 years old. For some time, he's been hearing all sorts of things in his head, including splendid music and wonderful instruments unimaginable on earth. From his wife's diary, we know on the evening of the 17th, some five days before, he wrote down a theme the angels had sung to him. And then he lay down watching those angels floating all around him, offering revelations in wonderful music. Then the dawn came and the angels disappeared to be replaced by demon voices and ugly music. They said I was a sinner and they would throw me into hell and they fell on me in the forms of tigers and hyenas. On the 7th of March, he was admitted to a psychiatric ward, and he never left. Throughout the next two years, he continued to write sporadically, both music and poetry. But most of these were torn up in frustration or anger, as he gradually drew into himself, losing the ability to converse. One thing stood out, though, a chorale harmonized to the following words. Wenn mein Stundlein vorhanden ist und ich soll hinfahren meine Straße, geleite mich, Herr Jesu Christ, mit Hilf mich nicht verlasse. Dein Geist an meinen letzten End befehle ich, Herr, in deiner Hand. Du wirst ihn voll bewahren. When my final hour arrives, to depart from this earth, I beg thee, Lord Jesus Christ, to help me in my last suffering. Lord, my soul, at the end, I commit into thy hands. Thou knowest well how to protect it. He'd stopped eating, and in spite of the efforts of staff to feed him by inserting a gastric tube down his throat, his decline continued. Finally, on the 28th of July, 1856, two years later, Clara was allowed to visit him, accompanied by Brahms. Clara, his wife, wrote, he was always talking a lot with his spirits and would become restless if one stayed too long. Just once I heard him say, my, surely he meant to say, my Clara, because he looked at me in such a friendly way. He accepted wine and jellied consomme with the happiest expression and truly in haste. He gulped the wine from my fingers. Ah, he truly knew it was me. Schumann died the next day, alone. From Clara's diary, I saw him only half an hour later I stood by his corpse, my ardently beloved husband, and was quiet. All my thoughts went up to God with thanks that he is finally free. And as I knelt at his bed, it seemed as if a magnificent spirit was hovering over me. Ah, if he had only taken me along.
Schumann had been one of the most greatly admired and influential figures of his generation. And he was married to the equally celebrated performer, the pianist and composer Clara Wieck. Between them, they had eight children. So one can only imagine how complicated and chaotic their lives must have been. Even getting married had been a mission, as Clara's father was dead set against it, going so far as to take to the courts in an attempt to prevent the marriage. But what strikes me the most is how passionately they lived their lives, combining parenthood with composition, composition, performing as well as supporting a large circle of fellow musicians and composers. Schumann himself was prey to huge mood swings, which affected both his personal and professional life. And when he died, yes, there were a number of significant compositions which had yet to be performed, including the cello concerto. What makes this piece special for me is that it seems to reflect Schumann's whole life, the good and the bad, but particularly his relationship with Clara, his wife. Without getting too technical, there are a number of musical fragments, sort of signatures that Robert used in his music to represent his love for Clara, mostly based on this musical signature of her name. So the notes, it's complicated, don't ask me to explain it. They're C, B, A, G sharp, A, and he manages to get Clara's name um, out of that. B natural in German is H, for example, and Chiara is the Italian for Clara, so. <laughs> but this theme and variations on it, it's a bit like um, you know, that word game you play when you have um, eight notes, uh, eight, eight uh, letters, and you, you have to f make as many words as you can out of it. It's the same with, with these sort of musical signatures that a lot of composers used. And so he would use which we heard in the Agnus Dei just before. That was the and it appears near the beginning of the cello concerto as well. Concerto, the music already becomes impassioned, wide anguished leaps and runs before it falters, rising once more before falling back and the orchestra takes over with the first main tutti. It's not all anguished passion in the concerto though. The slow movement is a beautiful duet for the soloist and the principal cellist. Surely a love duet between performer and composer. So where does Brahms fit into all of this? Well, where do we start? In 1853, five months before Schumann's attempted suicide, 
the 20-year-old Brahms traveled to Dusseldorf on the recommendation of Joseph Joachim. Brahms's biographer, Max Kalbeck, describes him thus. A vigorous youth who still seemed almost like a child. With his blonde hair, his high voice, and his big blue eyes, he came upon Schumann like an apparition from another world, sent down to resurrect and soothe his repressed, hopeless, and despairing self. Clara called him a heavenly messenger, deliberately sent by God. Schumann called him a genius, the true apostle who could capsize the world in a few days. And then finally, a demon. The brief visit became a month-long stay where Brahms was a daily guest at the Schumann's home, becoming an honorary big brother to the children. Schumann drew him into his circle of loyal supporters, while Clara was attracted by his free spirit and their shared aspirations as fellow virtuosi. And when Schumann was incarcerated in, in the asylum, Brahms returned to help Clara look after the household, caring for the children while Clara was away on concert tours, and staying off and on over the next two years until Schumann's death. Perhaps it's not surprising that notwithstanding the 14-year age gap, they became close. Indeed, by June 1854, Brahms was writing to Joachim, I think I'm in love with her. Often, I have to hold myself back forcibly from just simply putting my arm around her. And, oh, I don't know. It seems so natural to me, as if she wouldn't mind at all. It was only last night when I was um, giving this talk in Auckland that I realized those last five notes that are in that um, section of the, the romance by Clara Schumann are the first five notes in Schumann's first violin sonata. Hmm. <laughs> what a mess. Okay, so um, both he and Clara must have been only too aware how close they were to coming out, uh, to acting out the plot of Schumann's only opera, Genoveva. In it, the hero Siegfried goes off to battle, leaving his wife in the care of his steward, who was already attracted to her. Moreover, the theme that Schumann uses when Siegfried directs the steward to look after his wife is the Clara theme, this time undisguised. Just imagine how complicated and emotionally strained this period must have been. Clara had been told by Schumann's doctors not to visit, so it was Brahms who regularly traveled to Bonn and reported back to Clara on his continuing decline. A month or so after Schumann died, Brahms and Clara traveled to Switzerland together, spending a week in isolation, after which a decision was taken to go their separate ways. 
Clara wrote upon her return, I feel as if I were returning from a funeral. After some time, the friendship was rekindled, and over the next 40 years, there were countless letters written, with Clara remaining one of Brahms's closest confidants. At Brahms's request, many of these letters were destroyed, but still 759 remained to be later published. But it was not only through letters that the friendship continued. Brahms like Schumann before him, was hiding his own musical signature for Clara in his compositions. Initially, he used Schumann's own version before crafting his own more positive version, replacing the G-sharp with a G-natural. It would be lovely to think that he came up with the theme of the last movement of his first symphony in this way. We certainly have the right notes, C, B, A, and G. continued to use variations on this thematic material throughout his compositions, but it's only very late in his life that we perhaps see a complete declaration of undying devotion to Clara. In 1892, almost 40 years after that first fateful meeting, Brahms wrote three intermezzi for solo piano. The final one, in C-sharp minor, he described as the lullaby of all my grief but it is the first one which seems to me the most heartfelt. Disguised as a Scottish folk song, it is perhaps Brahms's final working of his own Clara theme, with the melody now spanning an entire octave and prefaced with the upbeat we found in the first symphony. I know when I play the works in tonight's concert, I will be very aware of the toll this music has taken on the composers, the struggle it took to bring even the most gentle of melodies from dream to reality, and how privileged we, the musicians, are to be able to recreate their vision and bring their music back to life for you.
So to finish, here is Brahms's response to Joachim, who had written to tell Brahms that Clara was about to die. throughout a long life with ever-increasing love and admiration. This is the way we should mourn her. Enjoy the concert. 